So would you please open your copy of God's Word to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, as we continue to think through leadership lessons from the edge of the promised land. We're looking at faith-filled Christianity, faithfulness as leaders in our ministries. In the last session uh, where I spoke, we considered together Numbers chapter 13 and 14. It was a, a catastrophic moment, you remember that word, nevertheless, or however, where everything changed in the history of the nation of Israel, the people of God at the time. When they failed to obey God, they failed to move into the land that had been promised, that God was going to give them. We noted back then that they made at least three mistakes. First, they were discouraged by comparing themselves horizontally to the people of the land. They're bigger than us. They have stronger, they have strong fortifications. Then they doubted. They asked, can we do this? Wrong question. Failing to compare the people and the fortifications vertically to an omnipotent God, to both His unlimited power and His perfect promises. That's what they fail, failed to compare it to. They should have known His faithfulness, His 100% record, and then they were influenced negatively by democracy, where ten spies influenced the people despite the clear, clear command of God. And only two spies back then showed positive leadership, faithfulness, and ask the right question, not can we do it, but what has God commanded us to do? What has God promised? And these ten spies, they brought back that bad, that evil, that faithless report, rather than a faith-filled report, back from that land that was flowing with milk and honey, just as God had said it would be. And we need to learn from their mistakes as the people of God and as leadership of God's people today. And we're prone to the very same errors. And perhaps too often we compare ourselves horizontally with those around us. Forget who God is relative to any issue that we may have. When we understand who God is, we should never be discouraged, never doubt. And it helps us to stand in faith even when outnumbered, or others around us do not obey God. So the result back there in the book of Numbers, we saw it. That whole adult generation, apart from Caleb and Joshua, those, those two faithful spies, the whole generation was condemned with a decades-long death sentence to live in the wilderness outside the promised land, outside the blessing they could and they should have had. And we saw in the book of Numbers, what we saw there was one bookend of the 40 years in the wilderness. And now we turn our attention to the other bookend of that wilderness experience. And we come to Joshua chapter 1. So we fast forward through those 40 years. And in our reading, we, we came to the very border of Canaan again, right on the edge of the promised land again, on the brink, and we come to another very important moment. Perhaps you can imagine with me the people there looking over the Jordan River at what has been promised to them, this, this wonderful, fruitful land. But this time, a new generation but, but some of that group still carried with them the memory of what happened all those years ago. Surely, they were wondering, will, will we do any better than our parents? The initial account of what happened is, is actually spread over quite a number of chapters in Joshua. But it begins in the passage. The moment that I want to point you to is in the passage we just had read to us in chapter 1. And I want to show you what put them on the right track this time to success. 
Let me give you the headlines of the application this morning before we even get into the text. What are we looking at? What should we take away? What do, what do I want you to see? How should this change the way you live and the way that you lead? Well, I've already hinted at the first thing that jumped out. That there are two stunning statements by God Himself to Joshua in verse, nine, verse 7 and verse 8 about the true way to prosperity and success. It comes as a result of following God and His Word, not deviating from it, not letting it depart from your mouth. Trusting God is key to the Christian life and to ministerial faithfulness. We can also see other things jumping out of the text, even on an initial reading. Joshua is told multiple times by God to be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous, Verse 6, verse 7, verse 9. Never ignore the meaning of repetition in Scripture. Never an accident. When God repeats something, it's not for His benefit. It's because we need reminding. When God has promised something, you can then proceed with this kind of confidence. Finally, our verses show us that even though our God, who hasn't changed at all, since this event happened, even though He is sovereign and all-powerful, and even though He has everything under His control, His plans still include, still take account of our obedience and our trust in some way. And we can read about that strange dynamic in Scripture over and over again. It's undeniable. We have to be careful here, though. In some senses, God does not need us at all. He can do anything He pleases. But in His providence, in His plan, in His wisdom, He does use means to accomplish His will. Often us, His people. That's the tension of these two truths that are both clearly taught in Scripture that although God has everything in hand, there is no sense whatsoever that says, well, we can just sit back passively and watch it happen. No, it is somewhat of a conundrum. Always has been, always will be, but we submit to what we find in Scripture. We see God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. We see God's sovereignty and your responsibility. At points when we consider God and His ways, we must conclude that they are above our ways and that He is God and I am not. Commentator Roger Ellsworth says this, we are not to drive a wedge between sovereignty and responsibility. The fact that God has promised something does not mean that we can sit in mere idleness. The same God who ordains certain ends also ordains the means to those ends. And then he gives an example from the book of Acts showing that dynamic. We should not be surprised, he goes on, we should not be surprised then that the Apostle Paul could promise that all on board his storm-tossed ship would be saved and yet would not survive if they did not take appropriate action. What is the general teaching we must grasp and consider? Both, both this passage and both in this passage and the way that we live today, in His wisdom, God uses people, God uses means in His plan to accomplish His purposes. At certain times, we are told what to do. We are told the way to blessing, to prosperity and success. You saw that in the text. So those are some of the main teachings. But let's look at this narrative in a little bit more depth. What's happening here? Essentially, what is different this time? Forty years later, that ultimately brings about the people crossing into Canaan, the walls of Jericho falling flat, and the nation of Israel finally receiving this promised land. What does God say this time in chapter 1 that Joshua and the people respond to? 
What are the instructions? What are the teachings that God's people have to follow to be successful, prosperous? In God's eyes, God's definition of success and prosperity. A lot of questions that are important for us this morning as we consider how to lead God's people in these things. Look at chapter 1. Here are three points that are on your outline. Our first point is is this in verses 1 and 2. The same instructions are given. Point number 2, verses 3 through 6. The same God must be trusted. And then finally, verses 7 through 11. The same God needs to be followed, must be followed. So our first point, verses 1 and 2. The same instructions are given to the next generation. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. And what we should see immediately is it's the same instructions. One leader is gone. Another is raised up by God to lead the people. Leaders are ordained by God for our benefit, for the benefit of the the church to guide us. God has you in your particular position, leading your particular flock in His providence as an under-shepherd. So the same instructions are given to the next generation. No modifications. No simplifications. There is no bringing the bar a little bit lower here so that you can jump over it. He repeats the very same promise we've seen over and over again. I am giving you this land. Imagine, imagine with me those seemingly endless nights in the tents, around the campfire, out in the wilderness, year after year after year. There must, there must, have, been, there must have been some of them saying to each other, why didn't we trust? Why didn't we listen? Why didn't we go? Why did we listen to the wrong people? But also imagine those parents for those next few years until they died, bringing their children up, telling them that what God had promised, the new promise in 40 years, a land flowing with milk and honey, that promise is for you now, son, daughter. Now they've got a ticking clock. They have a time for him. Only six years to go. Only 17 of the old generation still to die. What strange times as they waited and reflected on past failure, as they thought about the next opportunity, as they got ready for it, as they stand on the very brink of the land again, 40 years after that rebellion against God. What's going through their minds? Through Joshua's mind. It was a picture of failure last time, not success. Thirst and hunger, both spiritually and physically in that wilderness for year after year, rather than God-defined success and prosperity. If only, if only we had trusted. If only we'd followed. And in mercy, in Joshua chapter 1, God speaks to Joshua and gives him and the people all they need here. Think back to that moment of rebellion, which they've must, they must have been thinking about. How many of you can remember 1984? How fresh is that in your mind? I was eight. The people rebelled against God those years ago, back in a place called Kadesh. You remember that Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb pleaded And if we were to turn back and rewind back into Numbers 13 and 14, we'd skim over that text and and we can see some of those truths that are relevant to what's happening. In chapter 13, verse 30, he addressed the crowd, Caleb did. 
We should by all means go up and take possession. We will surely overcome trusting God, trusting His promises. Chapter 14, verse 5. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the crowd. Verse 6. Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes at the mere thought of disobeying God. They said, the Lord is with us. Do not fear them, the people of the land. But then in verse 10, we saw the congregation intent on stoning them, and they did not go in. Well, what's happened since then? Since that catastrophic moment? Well, the story goes on in Numbers 14 to describe the condemnation of God in more detail. The glory of the Lord appeared before all the people, stopped the stoning. And then God condemns them for not believing, for not trusting in Him, despite all His glorious works. But there's a passage there where Moses pleads for mercy for the people. And thus, God does not destroy them right there and then. There is mercy shown. The punishment is still there. It's described over the the next verses for not having faith, for not believing the promises. And he does say, your corpses will fall in the wilderness, everybody 20 years old and up, except Caleb and Joshua. But importantly, he then promises this land to their children. And that's the start of the 40 years, until all that generation dies. The spies, the 10 spies, who brought a bad report, they died of a plague. Did not end well for them. And Moses told the people what God had decided. He had spoken. It was settled. They had had multiple chances, multiple appeals, but they failed to trust and act. And what a sad situation after hoping for that promised land for so long. So just remember that between those events in in the book of Numbers and where we find ourselves today in Joshua chapter 1, There's certainly a lot more complaining. There's a lot more murmuring, a lot more sin in that intervening period over multiple events. We see that straight after the initial failure. Some actually try to go into the land in their own strength. They took up arms. They were quickly beaten. Again, going against what God had said. He was not with them. There was no point being strong and courageous when you're not doing what God has commanded or what God has promised. God had declared the punishment. It wasn't conditional. It was set. It was too late to obey. Never forget that delayed obedience is disobedience. During that long period, there was things like Korah's revolt. There was Aaron's rod blossoming. The water from the rock, the bronze serpent being lifted up. There was the story of Balaam. There was the handover of power to Joshua. A lot of organizing for the future, for going into Canaan 40 years from now. It's not completely wasted time. But the progression of God's people, in some senses, is on pause What characterizes this period of 40 years is exactly what God said. Death. Death. This is all now preparation for entry into the promised land for a new generation. Further north now. They've moved to a different point. It's not crossing at the same place. Now next to Jericho. Approaching from a different angle. And Jericho is an important city. It's an intersection of trade routes. It's known as the City of Palm Trees. Wasn't too big. Apparently only about 12 acres in in size. Eight miles from the Jordan River. It can be marched around fairly quickly. It's a city surrounded by 1,500 feet mountains, limestone. And it's naturally protected It protects the people going in from the east. There was only a few places where you could get across into that land and easily cross the river. Now, look at that first verse in Joshua chapter 1. Perhaps this seems to suggest 
that Moses was the last to die of that generation. The end of an era. And the people, can I suggest, seem to be aware of the importance of that moment. Why? Because right on the dot, they're there. They're ready. On the edge of the land as the clock strikes zero. It seems to be a different attitude now, don't you think? They're, they're ready. A different attitude among the leadership. I hope so. And the early verses of the book of Joshua show that new era. Moses is dead. But what follows is Israel over these coming chapters finally realizing, taking possession of this inheritance. God giving it to them. If you just glance over the first few chapters, you can see what happens. Much of which we don't have time to get into this morning. But we find in Joshua chapter 1, the commissioning of Joshua. There's, there's also some of that back in Deuteronomy chapter 31 before Moses dies. And in chapter 2, we go into the story of Rahab and the spies and she protects them when they're being tracked down in the city. And then in chapters 3 through 5, the whole nation of Israel miraculously crosses the Jordan River with the water standing up in a heap upstream with the priests standing in the middle of the river on dry ground holding the Ark of the Covenant. What memories that must have brought back of the Red Sea. And then it's followed by the remarkable conquering of Jericho and Ai in the next three chapters. This is it. This is it. It started, but it, it takes time. It's not instantaneous, but it's certain. And importantly, you see that it involves the people of God being obedient. And it involves preparation. It involves action and cost. It's not like dominoes just falling over when the walls of Jericho collapse and we just walk in. No. The people are involved with blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice throughout this campaign across the land. But the outcome is certain because God has promised it. And by the time we reach the end of chapter 12, northern Palestine has been taken, end of chapter 22, they start allocating the land to the, to the different tribes. But look back at what I think is that critical moment. A moment of difference from the first time the people stood on the brink of the promised land. And that moment, I suggest, is found in chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Moses dies, verse 1. The leadership passes to Joshua, verse 2. And then from verses 2 through 9, God speaks to Joshua. Eight verses we hear from God where He explains... He points backwards and forwards and tells Joshua what to do. Verse 10 is the first time we hear Joshua's reaction to everything God says. Godly, faith-filled leadership. The very first words in verse 10 are then or so or and. As a direct result of. As a consequence of. This is what Joshua now does immediately. 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 As he assumes command, he's heard the instructions, he's heard the reminders from God, he acts, he leads, he brings people along with him in his obedience. Allow me to paraphrase verse 10. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. It's time. With God's help, let's go. It doesn't happen by itself. It doesn't happen randomly doesn't happen without preparation. God has been working in the people. He's been working in the leadership, using Moses and Joshua, even using the past failure. Look at the response of some of the leaders in verse 16. This is what they said. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone, whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. They're repeating it back now. It's not God saying it this time. It's the people 
It's the leaders. They look ready this time. They're equipped and prepared. Again in verse 7, God has reminded Joshua of his faithfulness. Verse 8, he reiterates nothing new when he tells Joshua to trust his word. Don't deviate from it. The instructions remain the same. The way to success remains the same. John Curry says, He, God, has equipped Israel to stand up to their enemies in three ways. Firstly, God promised to be with Israel as they entered the land of Canaan. Secondly, He raises strong leadership. Strong leadership in the person of Joshua. And thirdly, He gives the people His word to stand on and live by. They needed to be prepared then. And we as God's people, faithful leaders hopefully, in our ministries, we need to be prepared in the same way. We need to have the same foundation for success and prosperity. Not the world's definition, God's definition. Resolve to learn from mistakes. Mistakes do not have to be the final chapter in a story. We need to understand God's faithfulness and trusting His providence even when you know it's hard ahead with sacrifice ahead. And you see here, Joshua is the leader, the icebreaker, the example setter. So you need to be to prepare by bringing the Word, sticking to the path as Bunyan so vividly tells us in his allegory, Pilgrim's Progress. Don't take a step off it. Prepare for spiritual health in your life, in your family's life, in your church's life. Men, be strong and courageous. It takes a backbone with God's help. And part of what we seek to do as leaders is to prepare others. You do that from the pulpit, in the Sunday school room, in the counseling room, through other important ministries. And surely we want our people to be spiritually mature and react like this when issues come. And you see here the different levels of leadership. You have God leading. Then you have Joshua. And then you have those officers that we just read of responding to Joshua. And then you have the people below. You see how infectious this is? You need to be prepared. And when the time comes, you need to act. The preparation is for a purpose, action. And you prove that you were prepared by then stepping up when it matters. Proving that this is what you truly believe. Joshua in verse 2 is told by God to arise and cross the Jordan. In verses 10 and 11, Joshua gets to speak to the leaders. What does he say? Prepare within three days. We're going to cross over to the, the Jordan and take possession of the land. We are going to follow God's instructions. No scouting party asking the wrong questions this time. Have a look at chapter 2, verses 20 through to 22 through 24. This is after Rahab and the two spies coming back from Rahab. It says, They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. And the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun. What did they say this time? And they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hearts. And also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. That's different. And our Christian lives need to impact every area of all that we do. What happens with your hands proves what has already happened in your heart. Reveals what you truly believe, who you truly trust. John Curry again says, Israel is to respond to God's command with valor, daring, and fortitude. They are in no way to be passive, but they are to prepare themselves, take heart, and have backbone to fight. Compared to 40 years earlier, back then they had all the same information, the same God, 
the same record of his faithfulness, the fresh memory at that time of him, being, of him delivering them from the Egyptians. But when it came down to it, back then they did not believe, they did not step up. And that showed the true position of their hearts. They had melted within them. At best, their faith was weak. At worst, many were likely unregenerate. You see, true faith results in fruit, evidence, action in your life and that of your congregation, in the way we fight sin, in the way that we live on the Word of God, in the way we manage our families, in the way we lead the church, where we need to instill in our people God's pattern that we need to submit to whatever we find in His church user guide. And in those crucial moments when you need to stand and fight, being strong and courageous for what God has told you to do, even if it's costly. In all of these areas, we need to be prepared beforehand. Standing on the rock-solid teaching of Christ. Building the foundation of the house before the storm comes. Expecting the storm to come. When it does come, you do not crumble. With God's help, you stand and you help others. So our first point was that the same instructions are given to the, new, the next generation. It's not innovative, but they're led well. They know the truth. And that's the way to success and prosperity. Secondly, the same God needs to be trusted. The same God needs to be trusted, verses 3 through 6. He tells them the extent of the land, and then he says, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. What do we learn in those few verses? Frankly, wonderfully, the answer is not much. What do I mean by that? We should actually thank God that we don't learn too much new in this, these verses because it's the same message over and over again. God's promises remain. This is not a new message. These continue to be the same instructions of a, the same trustworthy God, the same way to prosperity and success. There's a lot of repetition here. And we know why, because we need it. I do. Certain points in Scripture that apply time and time again to different generations, including ours, we need to trust God and lead others in that same trust. Look at how God here in verses 3 to 4 reiterates much of what He said before all the way back to the original promise to Abraham. Echoes here. Everywhere you step, it's yours. He reminds him that it's the very same promise that then Moses heard. Then he describes the limits of the land. This isn't a new negotiation. There are no new terms. God ordained the limits of this land long ago. What else? Verse 4, we see God's sovereignty and power in His promise to protect them. Again, buttressing that with the truth that He is dependable. Verse 5, I did this with Moses and I will do this with you. I will not fail or forsake you. No one can stand before you. Listen, even if the people are still big, even in, in the last 40 years, they've built even bigger fortifications or added new technologies, new techniques for fighting. Doesn't matter. I am your God. His promise has not changed. The certainty has not changed. What has changed? The people. God remains sovereign and trustworthy. But this time, the people believe, trust, act, led by a godly man, with godly men, as we saw, as examples. He reminds Joshua that he had the same arrangement with Moses. And he will be with him in the same way. But they weren't prepared that last time. They did not step up. Their knowledge of God and His track record was not the same. 
and they'd been disciplined. Disciplined with the purpose of restoration. They'd been punished, but not without mercy. And it's the same today. It's the same keys for spiritual vitality in your life, in your church. Know God. Understand His history. Understand His faithfulness and power. And trust God. Even if you have failed or fallen, there may be consequences from God. He is just. But any discipline is meant to warn, is meant to restore. The years can be restored that the locusts have eaten. Verse 5 here is a high point, a real comfort to Joshua and his people today too. He's told that they will be successful, that God would be there. Very similar to what God promised Moses in Deuteronomy 7 and Deuteronomy 11. No one can stand against you because I am with you. Same God, same promises. So our first point was the same instructions. Second point, the same God that needs to be trusted. And thirdly and finally, verses 7 through 11, the same God needs to be followed. It says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp, and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are going to cross this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Slight side note. You know, Caleb is not mentioned much in our narrative today. Joshua's the leader. Those two men, though, stood for... stood. For God, together, all those years ago. But we do return back to Caleb and a summary just slightly later in chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. And what we find is a a wonderful testimony about him that he followed the Lord his God wholeheartedly. What a testimony that we need to learn from. We prove our trust by following zealously and like Joshua and Caleb, we must understand the necessity of submission to God, to His instructions. He's all wise. That's man's responsibility. And our second point showed us His trustworthiness, His unchanging attributes. And this now is where the action comes, based on that foundation of truth. Does what they believe about God and His promises change the way they behave? Do they obey And they're commanded to be strong and courageous. They follow the express instructions of God. They do cross the river. They consecrate themselves. They get themselves spiritually ready before they do that. And then they follow the instructions to the letter. As they arrange everything to march around the city. As God told them to do. Multiple times each day. Reminds me of the story of Naaman in 2 Kings 5. Sometime later, commander of the army of the king of Aram in Syria. An enemy. And yet he went to the prophet Elisha who told him the way to be cured of of your illness is to wash seven times in a particular way in the Jordan River. He questioned it. But he ultimately did it. And he was healed. Why seven? Why not six, two, twelve? Who knows? The point was obedience. Following, just do it. And sometimes, God says to us, just do it. Why did these people have to march around Jericho so many times before it fell? Why like this? Why, why, why? Wrong question. Just do what God says will work. 
Our generation has become so skeptical of God and His way of leading the church, frankly, bluntly, because the instruction is clear. Sometimes the answer is genuinely, just get on with it, because God says so. He knows best. Friends, when God commands something, know your position. Submit. Just do it. It's for your good. They were told what to do. They crossed the Jordan River in chapter 3. They organized the priests and the trumpets and the ark and the people for six days and did as they were told. Not straying. And on the seventh day, eventually, after all the marching around, the walls fall in chapter 6, verse 20. And they capture the city. God gave it to them. But the people had to obey. They were successful and prosperous. We see here that success is following God carefully. Nothing is more important. Do what His Word says. That word do, it's essential in verse 8. Know the law. His Word. Proclaim it 24-7. says day and night. Have it on your lips and in your heart. It's the lamp to your feet and the light to your path. Psalm 119. You see that day and night, that's the duration. That's how often we should meditate on it. And then we see which part of His Word right after. All of it. And if we do that, what's the result? For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. And then we see in verse 9 that true success in life is knowing, is truly knowing that the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's clear. Submit to the law. Submit to God's Word. Do not deviate. Be careful. Be intentional. Be thinking about it. Be talking about it consistently. But not just that. Do it. Follow Him. Obey all of it. Whatever God says. That's a truly successful life. Never earning our way to heaven. We're not talking about that. But to show you are truly His. That you have a genuine, regenerate heart. This is the leader setting the example for others to follow. And it cascades. Commentator Howard says, it is striking that God's instructions here to Joshua are not about military matters. Given that Joshua and the Israelites faced many battles ahead, however, the keys to his success were spiritual, directly related to the degree of his obedience to God. The keys to Joshua's success were the same as those for a king, being rooted in God's Word rather than depending on military might. That's the reason why you don't need to be frightened of anything when you stand with God. Why don't you need to be dismayed? God's command is to be strong and courageous multiple times when you are following His will. It's a lesson of faith. It's standing firmly on God's promises. Not being strong and courageous in a fool's errand that isn't promised or commanded by God. Look at the reaction of those two different groups. People of Israel in chapter 2, verse 24. They said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. That word keeps coming up. It was their own hearts that were melting last time. You see, you see how God, Joshua, the leaders, and now the people are in, you know, they're, they're lifted up by examples, by leadership. And then secondly, not just the people of Israel, look at the reaction of the people of the land of Canaan inside the city of Jericho in the account of Rahab. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Rahab speaking to the spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. They're terrified. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. How many times do they have to use this word? Our hearts melt or the opponents of God's hearts will melt? Which way do we want it? 
For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. They've heard that. That's 42 years ago. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, again, our hearts melted. And no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. So the key to successful leadership is having God with you. Then your heart doesn't melt and other people's hearts melt. That faith-filled and God-centered leadership is infectious. No one can stand before you when this is the case. It's the key to successful leadership, to ministerial faithfulness, standing on the Word of God, and in that context, being strong and courageous. The favor and presence of God is of ultimate importance. He is a trustworthy promise keeper. Canaan is a gift from God. It says that multiple times. It says it in the perfect tense. And that regularly gives the sense that it's something that's already happened. It's completion. They're not in the land yet, but it's already theirs. It's already given to them before they go in. They have the title in their hands as they cross the Jordan, but there's work to do. There's obedience to happen. Look at what happened now. They were finally in the land. Chapter 5, verse 7, Passover again. And just before that, reinstating circumcision. They'd not been doing these things in the wilderness. This is a return to true worship. This is restoration. Undeserved mercy of God through the true success of following God and His Word. But even if you mess up, the answer is to turn to God in repentance and seek restoration and get back to carefully following. So we've seen our three points. Same instructions. Same God to be trusted. Same God to be followed. I wonder as we close, if you have something from years ago, or maybe not years ago, that you regret. Maybe you fell into grievous sin even. May or may not be disqualifying. We're not going there right now. And there are huge consequences. So I ask first, have you repented? Have you got up again and pressed on again with God's help? Have you fixed what you can fix related to that circumstance? Looking back in the story, I I really hope that there were those, even in those that were condemned to die in the wilderness, I really hope that there were some who repented before they died. I really hope there were some parents who urged their children and prepared their children and congregation, do better than I did. Perhaps that's what you need if you haven't already, to stop others following your path. Have you installed the safety bumper rails to help others and to keep yourself from those things? Have you now taught your children, your family, your congregation the the Scriptures so that they are prepared and ready when these times come so that they trust God, so that they are truly successful and prosperous in God's eyes, not the world's eyes? Preparing that next generation to please be better than we are in our generation. My friend, what do you need to change in your pastoring, in your leadership to lift people for the next generation when the baton needs to be passed on? Yes, the people you are accountable for will stand before God alone on Judgment Day. They will. But you can see how your actions, your unfaithfulness, your sin, your lukewarmness can impact others. With God's help, it's not too late to do better. You can yet improve. You can submit to Him. You can follow His Word fully, not divert to the left or the right. You can have God's Word consistently in your mouth. Surely reminds us of the end of Joshua's life where we see a resolve in him. In Joshua 24, 15, 
If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods, gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But there may be people in your churches where their parents have messed up. Maybe your parents messed up in, in some way. Happens in our passage, doesn't it? What if there are terrible consequences that impact you or other people in your congregation? Imagine that 17-year-old who watched their father fall that first time. He's now been living for 40 years in the wilderness because of the mistake of somebody else. He still remembers Egypt as a boy. In his middle teens, he remembers walking through the Red Sea on dry land with water stacked up miraculously. And he's since been living in temporary accommodation in less than perfect circumstances outside the blessing that could have been his. If only, if only. Listen, something horrible may have happened in your life or in the lives of people in your congregation. It may be obvious who's to blame. Maybe it is the parents. What's the message though? God did show mercy to them. They were still punished. There were still consequences, but there was still mercy. But secondly, today the, the finger is pointed at us. Not your parents. We have the same instructions from God. The same God needs to be trusted today. The same God needs to be followed today. We don't use the failure of others as an excuse. We don't become victims and live a life on pause. It's time for you to prepare and for you to step up and to pass that same message on to others who struggle with these things in your congregation. My father failed. I might fail. Well, our passage today completely knocks that on the head. You stand alone before God. You're responsible alone before God. With God's help, you can do better. You can submit to Him. You can follow His Word. You cannot divert to the left or the right. God's Word should be consistently in your mouth. These children did not make the same mistake as their parents. But I'd encourage you to show mercy and forgiveness to those who did make mistakes that have perhaps impacted you. Look at the purpose of this book as we finish. It's summarized for us much later in chapter 21, verse 43. Listen to how successful your God is after all of these events. He says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land which He had sworn to give to, give to their fathers. All of it. And they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that He had sworn to their fathers. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. And the Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises, not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. 100% success. 100% faithfulness. This book of victory and conquest continues the theme that God keeps His promises. Jericho's just the first installment. Do you see your responsibility to pass on the wonderful works of God to your children, to your flock? And after they had passed through the River Jordan, Joshua instructed them to set a memorial in place so that they would remember not their own achievements, but what God had done for them says in chapter 4, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea. They're remembering 40 years ago. He dried up, which He dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that, purpose statement, you may fear the Lord your God forever. Do you do anything like that in your home? Do you pray or in your church? 
and then show people and remind them how prayers were answered? Do you take them to the faithfulness of God, testify to His goodness? Remember how negatively infectious and discouraged the doubting leaders were back in Numbers years ago. But now look at the leaders in Joshua's time, verse 16. They answered, positively infectious, Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us to do, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. That's 100%. Now by no stretch am I suggesting too much here. More problems are to come for the people of God. More mistakes will be made in the centuries between then and when we're looking at today. But for a moment, they got it right. For a moment. And God blessed them. They were discouraged all that time to, before. They were doubting anything but strong and courageous. They were weak and shrinking cowards. They didn't trust. They didn't follow. They weren't prepared. They didn't step up. They didn't submit. They failed. But Joshua and his people did prepare. Stood on the right foundation. They did step up. They did submit. They did trust God and His promises. They were successful and prosperous because Joshua, as leader, obeyed God and feared God and followed God's leadership. They understood finally, and perhaps only briefly, that God is sovereign, but they had responsibility that they lived up to. And brothers, now we have a greater Joshua to follow. As new covenant believers, there are similarities here between Joshua to our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the name Joshua, we see it. It means the Lord is salvation. The Greek equivalent of Jesus. And this in many ways all foreshadows Jesus leading His people to their promised inheritance. Our great captain. He's the greater Joshua. You find it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, where it talks of an even greater day, like this, but greater after this, in the future, that another Jesus Himself would bring. We see that certainty ahead, that we hold the same title deed in our hands to our place in heaven because of the completed action of Jesus Christ. We too can speak of it in the perfect tense, as our home, we too will inherit a land eternal, no remaining threats from outside, but it's already yours, believer. What an encouragement to press on to win the prize, already secure, but we have to keep faithfully following, consistently, continually meditating on His Word until that day when we cross the Jordan River, so to speak. God is the constant in this whole story. Leaders come and go, but God will be with His people always. He could be strong and courageous, Joshua, because of God's promises, God's equipping. He knew, and he knew that His all-wise God would be with him. That's true success, brothers. Praise God that He uses normal, frail people, leaders, like you and I, still today. It's a story that passes from generation where you're left with a question. Do you want to be truly successful and prosperous in your life, in your family, in your church, in your ministry? We have instructions right here to put us on the right tracks, in the right directions. Know Him. Trust Him. Follow Him. Have His Word in your heart, on your lips, day and night. My friend, you don't have to stay out there in a barren wilderness anymore. Live a faith-filled life. Be a faithful leader. All praise and glory to Him. Let's pray. Father, how we thank You for Your faithfulness. Even in the midst of when we are so often unfaithful to You or lukewarm or we don't have a wholehearted, full-throated love for You. Lord, we pray that You will help us to address the issues, that You will help us to become more and more faithful, that you will fill us with your Spirit so that this would be positively infectious amongst ourselves, our people, our families, everybody we influence. So God, work through us, we pray, to your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hello. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pastor David. And here we see uh, yesterday, it was the failure in Kadesh. And now, new leader, new people, but the same God. And that should be the hope that we can all take from this. So as we go to our uh, Q&A, for those who may just be attending now, just fresh reminder, approach the microphone after you have been recognized, raising your hand, ask your questions as straight, you know, in a straightforward manner, and please don't be argumentative. We want everybody to learn. Uh, if you have something to pursue with the speaker, I am sure he would be willing to uh, uh, give you time privately and uh, please tell your name and your church and the place where you are from. Again, just reminder, please turn to silent mode all your gadgets and phones. We do not want to be distracted by the, your ringtone, however nice it sounds. So uh, is there anyone who would like to ask the first question? Those of you online, you can uh, type in your question on the Zoom chat section or the Facebook comment section. Yes. Hello, Pastor. Uh, I am Romaric Guerrero from Reformed Baptist Church of Pampanga. You said that in our pursuit to ministerial faithfulness, there should be no revisions, no simplifications as far as God's instruction to us is concerned. And this is my question. Is this principle a necessity or a prerequisite to uphold the regulative principle of worship in the context of corporate gathering? Because the temptation for us ministers to become relevant to all these forms of entertaining approaches inside the church, we succumb to give in to revisions and innovations. As we all know, every appearance before God in worship must have what God requires or what God prescribes. So can you please enlighten us? Thank you. Yeah, it's entirely relevant to the regulative principle and only doing what God tells us to do in, in worship, not watering down, not adding, not taking away. Um, there, are, there are times where, you know, you're speaking to a young people's group. That's not what I mean by simplification. You know, it, we, we, we speak to the level that we have in front of us, but we, we never compromise on the truth in any way. And we never try to do something to attract people in that is, that is worldly, that it attracts the world. You know, we, we, we stick with what God says works. And, and the means given to us are very clearly prescribed in, scri in Scripture. The, you know, the predominant means of the declaration of God's Word. And, and also, my opinion is, is not relevant here. I don't bring my opinion to the pulpit. My job is to declare to you with the authority of thus saith the Lord what God says in here. Nothing more, nothing less. That's where the power is. You may be able to gather a crowd of thousands by having a, you know, a drama and wonderful bands and things like that. But they're there for the wrong reasons. And God works through what He says He works through. The declaration of truth. The living word. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes, uh, Rolly. Good morning, uh, Pastor. I am Rolly Kerry, a uh, member of the Liman Reform Baptist. I sorry, <laughs> of these on Reform Baptist Church. Uh, may not be directly related to your preaching, but it has something to do with the Promised Land. Some. Because of the recent or ongoing siege of 
Israel and the promised land, Canaan, or, well, in that case, uh, yun sa Hamas incident, some, some, uh, some persuasions have, you know, uh, charged that the Israel or the Israelites or the tribe of Israel are at fault for intervening and invading that land. Uh, of course, uh, I am not of the same persuasions, but perhaps you can tell us or you can tell me uh, what would be the, the proper response of Christians or Amils uh, at this, uh, during this situation? Yeah, that's a very, very difficult to answer in just a couple of minutes. Um, we, our heart breaks at any uh, travesty in the world, at death of people who are made in the image of God, whether they are Jew or Muslim. Uh, it's heartbreaking to see. We want all people to come to Christ. Uh, there is, um, at least from where I speak, I'm English, but I live in America, there are a number of groups in America that are very tightly um, tied to a thought that one day the Jerusalem uh, will have the temple rebuilt and things like that, and, and that's not what I believe. Um, there may well be a resurgence of salvation among the Jews. I would be a, an optimistic millennial, and if God's chooses to save lots of Jews, praise God. I, I, I hope that happens. Um, but I, I think this is two groups of unbelievers fighting. Uh, I think what happened with Hamas going in is, is a, a tragedy, and I'm sure there is sin on both sides. Um, and we should protect the innocent. Um, I, I don't know. I, I grieve over the situation, and the only solution to the situation for everybody involved is Christ and Christ alone. Uh, can I ask uh, Pastor Noel for his comment too? <laughs> yes, yes, you may. <laughs> Uh, attend GMA. Uh, regardless of your eschatological position, whatever you think of Israel, I for one believe that Israel is not a second plan or even first plan of the Lord. Uh, the plan for Israel has expanded to the global uh, mission of the church. But nonetheless, look, looking as an observer, I do believe that uh, uh, Hamas here is on the wrong side. Israel is defending itself. And you will hear so many uh, propositions of uh, Israel being guilty of genocide. South Africa has uh, charged Israel in the uh, international court of genocide and all that. Uh, they just do not, many of these do not know the history, the fact that in 2005, Gaza was already set free by the Israelis. Uh, the charge of occupation is just not true historically, uh, but the Palestinians of Gaza chose Hamas to rule over them. That's why in the West Bank, they are not doing any elections. They are under Fatah. And they're not doing any elections because if they do, they'll choose Hamas. So the Palestinians are choosing Hamas as their leaders. And when the Hamas did the October 7 attack, uh, the Palestinians celebrated. And uh, so I'm not for the killing of the innocents, but in a time of war, uh, when uh, the combatants use a shield, the civilians, it is based on the uh, Roman st uh, Rome statutes that that is a, uh, a, cri a war crime. 
And so it's not Israel that is doing the war crime here. I'm not just on the side of Israel, but I'm on the side of who was the invader and who is defending uh, their side. I think Israel is defending their side without me believing that Israel is a special nation that has a different plan by God uh, for fulfillment. Well, that's more political than theological. <laughs> But other questions coming back to the promised land as, of, as it was about to be conquered. Other questions? Meron pa, you can, pwede kayong magtanong sa Tagalog, I'll just translate. Yes. Good morning, Pastor. Uh, my name is RJ Martin. I'm from Jensan, General Santos City. Uh, from Alliance Church, Kamakop. Uh, my question is, with regards to the first point, that God has given us the same instruction to the next generation. I was just curious, uh, is it possible that God might change His instruction, depend, um, his instruction to the current generation? where that instruction can be relevant to the current situation? Well, the instruction that was, was in that particular case did not, did not change. Um, the word of the God stands forever. His word is all sufficient. Our, you know, we're not expecting any more revelation. Um, were you trying to relate that to today? Uh, and the, the commands of God today? And I, I didn't, okay. Uh, go to the mic if you want to. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, like, for example, there are people and pastors changes instruction with regards to LGBTQ plus, 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 plus. And then they try to uh, integrate it to the, 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 the biblical instruction. So how would we as pastor um, connect or integrate God's um, same instruction to this generation without compromising the truth? Yeah, yeah. we need to view the truth of God as a whole. And so when you talk about LGBTQ+, plus, whatever, um, People are trying to read back their position into Scripture and try to find justification. But at the same time, it's like Thomas Jefferson. I don't know if you know that story in Thomas Jefferson in, in America where there is a Bible you can go and see in a museum where he took a pair of scissors and cut out all the parts he did not like. He created his own religion, his own God. And yet our attitude is that we take the whole book, all the book, in context, and we don't try to crowbar in sin effectively. And, and God has spoken very clearly on that subject. One man, one woman for marriage. No sexual relations outside of that one man, one woman. There's no wriggle room there. And yet people try to say, okay, well, I don't like uh, the attribute of the wrath of God. So let's just focus on the attribute of the love of God. And, and you cannot separate those two things. It has to be balanced and in context. And yes, He loves. He shows grace. He shows mercy. Even to LGBTQ plus people who can be saved. But also the message of Scripture is God does not leave people where they are. 
the gospel is transformative and does not leave people in those circumstances. So when you see a rainbow flag on a church, do they have them here? Rainbow flags on churches? Yeah? Then that's a, that's a compromise. You, you don't put sin back in. We are, we are to fight sin. We are to, to be forgiven from sin. And a true understanding of the gospel knows that Jesus Christ died for that sin. And yet, if you continue to live in that sin, in that example, I know it's just one, then, then you make a mockery of the cross of Christ if you keep doing that. Thank you. And I think David uh, showed us an example of using a text from the Old Testament pointing us to Jesus Christ, and that ultimately is our relevance because uh, Jesus Christ is the ultimately contemporary man in the sense that there is never a time when you can say Christ is only relevant to a particular generation. He is relevant to all generations. And when it comes to relevance, I agree with one uh, author of preaching who said, the text is already relevant. The problem is many there are many irrelevant preachers. So we should be relevant preachers because our text is already relevant. Jonathan. Good morning, Pastor David. Uh, Pastor Jonathan from Sovereign Grace Community Church in Caloocan City. And uh, this is my question. Pastor, you said that the true success in ministry is whether God is with us. Wherever He is, He is with us. And that is the success in Joshua 1.9. Uh, can we balance or, or how can we balance the idea that uh, we don't deny God is giving us favor through material blessing and the idea that the true success of ministry is whether God is with us, which is, I think, not necessarily favor for material blessing. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, we have the phrase that we, we live in Coram Deo, in the very face of God. And we need to have that reality before us all the time. But success and prosperity is God's definition. Success and prosperity may not mean a long life, a long ministry. For some, like Hugh Latimer or John Huss, that meant death in the flames. That was success. That was, that was, being, that was a witness to the glory of God. And many people have been encouraged by that, and at the time they were witnessed to by the stand of those men who were martyrs. That doesn't look very successful in the world's eyes, but in God's providence, He used that, what looked like a failure, that death, to His glory. And so, we, we have to recalibrate our thinking. What is success? Does it mean a big church? Does it mean people being converted? There are many examples, like John Patton uh, as, a, as a, a missionary who saw almost no fruit, and, and yet it's, he was still faithful, even in what he was called to. And we do not, we leave the success of the planting and the scattering of the seed, we, lay, we leave the germination to God. So we are called to be faithful, and we leave the results to Him. Okay, thank you. And again, uh, just to point out that uh, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. Now, the one who planted may not show the fruit, uh, but he has fulfilled his role. And that is, to me, what success is. We often hear, I'm sure you all know of James Hudson Taylor and his successful quote-unquote mission in China, who has heard of Robert Morrison, who went ahead of James Hudson Taylor in China, and he sowed the seed, and the germination was ripped by James Hudson Taylor, and yet to the world's eyes, it's James Hudson Taylor always forgetting Robert Morrison as a missionary who did not have much of the visible fruits, but he was successful in the sense that he played the role that God has assigned to him. So be content with the role that God has given to us. Last two questions. 
Yes. Blessed morning, Pastor David. Um, as pastor. A name and church, please. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Pastor Argel uh, from Life Mission Baptist Church from Roa City, Capiz, uh, Seafood Capital in the Philippines. As pastor, we cannot avoid conflict in the ministry, in the church. And this conflict comes from unresolved issues. And uh, many pastors quit in the ministry for, for an unresolved conflict in the church, in the family. As pastor or leaders in the church, which first you're going to resolve? Issues or relationship? Sorry, I lost the last part of that. Who will resolve issues or disputes uh, in relationships? For pastors? Yeah. Okay. So this is back to some of the advice that was yesterday. You know, when you only have... Correct me if I'm, I'm missing the point here, but... When you only have a single elder or a single pastor, there are difficulties there. Um, and you need to start looking to other pastors in other churches, other faithful men, ministerial academies for advice, and, and they can help you with that. And, and yet, conflict is a difficult thing. There are many people in the world today who are looking for conflict. And we have to discern between mountains and molehills. Do you have moles in the Philippines? Little, they just, they're just a little pile of dirt or a big mountain. And people, some people make everything a mountain, and they will die on that mountain. But in reality, they are secondary or third level, fourth, fifth level issues, and they're really down here. But there are some believers who will die for everything they believe, and, and there needs to be some discernment that, okay, there are things, and we see this in church history, there are things, brothers, where we should be willing to die for the truth of Scripture, for the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way. But then you get down here to other things, and, and sometimes we have to be open-handed and disagree in love and maintain unity. So there's a, there's a spectrum here of issues, the, the, the pillars of the faith. That's where we say, we will not move one inch. One inch. But then there are other things further down where, okay, I may disagree with you on certain things and I still love you, brother. And there are certain things where, okay, there comes a line where I can still worship with you or I, you will still have them preach in your church even though you may disagree on some things down here. Uh, and, yeah, in, in the family too, um, we have to have a clear-headed um, focus on what is and is not important and not die down here for something, not, not say, I'm immovable on this, and if you disagree with me on this, we're done. There's a big problem. We need to do all of this with humility and, and grace. You have a follow-up? Uh, yes. So you go first with resolve first the issue rather than relationship. Issue or relationship. I, I, I don't know how I can... Pull those apart. You're, you're asking about what? issues in relationships? Okay. Yes. Yun ang sagot niya. Yung sagot niya ay may mga bagay na hindi mo kailangang uh, gawing uh, issue of separation. And then may mga bagay na you can disagree, to, uh, you agree to disagree. I uh, will give the last question to uh, from an inquirer online from Virgilio Gasco. I happen to be chosen as one of the leaders of civic organizations. I find opportunities to share the true gospel. It seems people in these groups show even greater or better enthusiasm than some of the people like family members that are regularly served Bible studies. Can you comment on this? Okay, so this gentleman works for a civic organization and sometimes they are more interested in biblical things. Um, 
than people in Bible studies. I, my comment is that's, that's a sad reflection on the people of God in churches and Bible studies. I, I don't know. Have I misunderstood? Well, that's what I meant. Uh, you don't ask situation-specific questions because <laughs> we cannot tell the whole story of that. So ask questions that are of matter of doctrines or principles or uh, something that can be answered in a more general way when you become situation-specific. Uh, no one here has the gift of prophecy to know uh, what, what the thing is all about. But we thank uh, Pastor David, and he will be speaking again in our last session today, and we continue to in anticipate what will be God's word uh, for today. One takeaway that we should have here is how God, in both His grace and uh, even judgment, may work in the next generation uh, different from the previous generation. In this case, from the failure of one generation and here, the success of the next generation. And the same can be reversed. The good things of a past generation can be undone by the next generation. So let us consider our generation as an opportunity, or maybe your generation, as an opportunity to undo the bad things of the past and take the opportunity from the Lord.